Test, test, test. One, two, three. Y'all know how I start these out. Test, test, test. You and me. You know I was going to do that, right? C One, come on two, in. One, two, three. Come on in. Come on in, everybody. Come on in. Oh, boy. Do I have a show for you. It's going to be a little long, so y'all be patient with me. Hello, everybody. So Walter, the So Walter Jones Show. I'm he. It is the evening edition. Baby. How y'all is? Come on in. The water is fine. Today I want to talk about a word, a word that we often heard, and that word is grief. Grief is something that we've all experienced. I don't know nobody uh, in my life, in my circle, in my family, and among my friends who have not uh, been, have, have suffered with grief. Uh, for something to happen to them, something whether it doesn't always have to be death. It could be the loss of something. It could have been the loss of a friend walked away, or it could have been, gosh, uh, even those who maybe a pet ran away or a, par a pet may have died. There are people who go through the grieving process even after losing uh, maybe even an inanimate object on and on. All right. And so I want to talk about this because this year has hit us really, really large. At the beginning of this year, the Lord gave me a vision. I had uh, gave a little word of knowledge on here, social media, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. And I talked about how I saw a vision of uh, bodies of, of people dying this year, not like uh, the uh, pre previous years and not because they were old and it was their time. But I saw a vision of young people dying. Uh, and as, especially the older, the elderly people and those who are serving in positions of authority, whether they are uh, politicians or whether they are CEOs of corporations or whether they are pastors and apostles and what have you. And I saw them just dying, just dying left and right. And I gave that little vision on social media and I talked about the reason why the, these leaders are going on uh, to be with the Lord. It is a message to us who are who are serving uh, with these men who are sitting up under their auspices and their direction and their leadership. There's a shifting that's happening in this year and it's happening for a reason. There's a wake up call and you just got to go to that show on YouTube when I talk about it. But the reason why I'm t talking about this grief uh, show today is because uh, my church uh, in particular, Faith Temple Church, in a little town called Evanston, Illinois. We have been hit a few times this year. At the time of this recording, it is 2019. Um, and so my, um, our pastor, the, the dear um, Bishop Carlos L. Moody, senior passed uh, this year, and it was a hard hit for us. And uh, for, for many, it was a hard hit because that was the only pastor that they knew. You understand? I've served with him for about uh, 20 years. And so it hit me hard. All right. Um, and then uh, shortly after his passing, uh, his, his, well, his son became the pastor of our church. And, and Bishop prepared him for this position. And then after after the passing of his father, then our, our present pastor, Carlos Moody Jr., his wife passed. And it was sudden, it was unexpected, and it hit us real hard. And then we, we, didn't, we couldn't even gr grieve properly for the passing of our pastor. And then his, his own uh, daughter-in-law, uh, she passes. And then another uh, a dear brother, father figure of ours, of our church, uh, passed uh, just a couple weeks ago. We call him Papa, Papa Southhall. All right. And there were other deaths that happened within our body um, and at our church who may not have been members, but they, they, they are members, but their family members might have passed. All right. And so the church have been going through some of it is silent grief because there are times that we don't say, we don't talk about it. We just move on. And, 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 and sometimes we seem like we're walking like robots. Uh, we, we are rejoicing in the Lord indeed. But then sometimes you may see after the rejoicing is over, you'll see that the, some may, may slump. Some may weep, uh, some uh, their continents change because they are reflecting on um, 
uh, or coping, trying to cope with what is now not what is now the norm and uh, and the the past is now gone. So I wanted to bring this up uh, because uh, our wonderful sister Arella Milam is over our our education at our church and she's over the Bible studies and and she had this wonderful idea this past Sunday. Uh, a pastor, an elder, that is an elder success, Mark success, preached uh, the gospel this Sunday at our church, and he talked about there is an elephant in the room. And I don't know, we have two big screens at our church, and, and there was two depictions of the elephant, that one elephant was inside the church sitting among the saints, and then on the right side of the screen was the elephant had imploded. He got fatter, and he bursted out of the windows of the church, and the, and the, and the top of the church was on his head. He was huge, all right? The elephant in the room, and the people were trying to figure out where was he going with this, and his point was grief. There's an elephant in the room, and it's called grief. And we just, we see it, but we're not dealing with it. We're trying to cope with it. And so Arella Milam, after the sermon of Sunday, decided to continue this subject on Wednesday night's Bible study, which was uh, last night. Uh, and we talked about it in detail. And the people came out, and you heard some of... Uh, uh, you people were very transparent about some things that they're seeing. So I want to talk about a little bit on, on the grieving process. I want to talk about the five stages of grief. I want to talk about even talking to the dead. I want to do a show on dreams, though. Not today because it's going to take too long. But I want to talk about dreams. Maybe we can talk about it tomorrow. Why you dream and, and the proper way to interpret the dreams if you are able to. And if not, you could find someone who can interpret the dreams for you. Alvin Carter, good to see you, sir. Crazy self. My prayers are with you and your pastor. He, um, he lost his dad and his wife. Yes, Alvin. Yes, he did. Thank you, sir. Silent grief can be dangerous. Amen. Amen. Um, so how do I start here? And again, and again this show is um, dedicated and, and um, also the great idea of Aurelia Milam to continue this. But I want to thank God for Elder Success and Sister Milam for continuing this discussion. Next week, what we're going to do at our Bible study is bring in clinical people, professional, licensed counselors to talk to our church. Ah, oh, man, I don't think y'all understand what, what's going on here. This is a good thing for our church because this is a thing that don't happen to churches, especially African-American churches who are not well equipped to talk about these things or they skirt it. They throw it up under the work rug and don't want to talk about especially the natural things that happen when someone dies all right i was a part of a ministry where the pastor formed that church and these people uh these, these especially the young people were affected really hard but but the older ones as, as well and when this pastor died after being the past the only pastor of that church since the inception uh when he died unexpectedly uh, the people went into a grief process and they never really came together to talk about this this process or this thing, this thing that hurt them so much. And they didn't talk about it, which caused division to happen in the church. And there was fighting and murmuring. And um, there was um, there was discord among the brethren. And then before you know it, they, they figured, well, we, we got to get a leader. And there were elders that are there that were not really qualified to be the pastor, to, to lead, to continue uh, in a ministry, which is a shame. If you're a pastor and you have all these ministers and elders, yet when you pass, none of them are qualified. That says something, doesn't it? Well, that's another show, and I don't want to get too caught up in that because that could cause me to get into some trouble. Uh, this here is hitting too close to home. Leah Bonet, I know, it's really hitting home close, all right? So what the church have done, again, especially the African-American church, is that we are afraid of certain words. Psychology is a word we're afraid of. Mental illness is a, is a phrase we're, we're afraid of. There is a stigma against it. And so what we do is it's easy to grab some oil and 
poured on people. It's easy to speak in tongues and then lay hands on everybody and then send them home thinking that that's the thing that they're going to lean on exclusively. Where there is, an, you, it is important that we talk about the spiritual as well as the natural. And that's why, again, I'm glad, Sister Milam, we talked about the spiritual last night. And next week, we're going to focus more so on the natural as we bring in counselors to help us cope with the death of our pastor and our first lady. Um, I, I served under several men of God as my pastors, as I, you know, being a musician, you travel to and fro and then you join ministries or what have you. And that's why I've had so many pastors that I served under, um, because I'm being a musician. That's just the way it is. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's the way it is. But I, I took account and I realized that about, about six or seven pastors that I served up under are dead. Seven, I counted seven men of God that I, that I call pastor, they're dead. And I'm only, I'm in my early fifties. They're gone. And I have three first ladies who died. All right. So if anybody understand what grief is, I understand. But I want you to see this process here that I did this show a couple of week, couple of weeks ago. And I need you to, I need you to pay close attention to this show again, the body, uh, what, what soul and spirit. All right. This is important. I can, I, I, I seem, I may seem like I'm beating you upside the head with this, but if you don't understand this concept, you wouldn't know what to do when it comes to grieve. All right. Thank you. Uh, sorry. It's so good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. All right. The body, soul, and the spirit. And you, you gotta catch this because many people don't. I'm separating these, this here, because these two here kind of work together. Uh, the body interprets what the soul is feeling. And in the soul, there is psychology, okay? Uh, there, is, there is your character, all right? There is your character. These, these, this is how you feel, okay? Feelings, all kind of things. These are things that are happening in the natural. These are these uh, the things that happens uh, as a psychosomatic or uh, physiological things that the body interprets happens because of the soul. People who can't forgive, their soul can't forgive a person and uh, the body actually interprets unforgiveness. Okay, it interprets it. Yes, it does. Now, unforgiveness is not really a word. Um, you could try type it in, but <laughs> it's not really a word, but I think they're going to make it a, a word. Unforgiveness actually can cause the body pain. And there are people who've gone through chronic pain. Sometimes they call it psychosomatic stuff that happens, headaches and body aches and joint aches and then other diseases. And you get susceptible to well, free radicals and what have you, hap, uh, and what have you is because uh, you can't forgive, right? So the body again is just a robot. It is a puppet and it interprets what the soul is feeding it. You understand? So the, there is a, there is a battle of the mind and this is the soul is, that's where the mind is and the, the, the good and evil. Uh, Jesus wants your mind and Satan wants it too. And you have a choice in the matter who you want to give it up to. Now the spirit here. Uh, is important here because there's there's evil and then there's good. All right, and this spirit, uh, it, it there's there's those who walk in an, an evil spirit. They become sons of Satan. They're the sons of the evil one, or Lucifer. All right, and Jesus said that the, these men were. Uh, uh, of their father, the devil, who was a murderer in the beginning. So you can be, you can decide to be a son uh, like Cain. Cain was removed from the genealogy of Adam. He became a son of Satan. All right. So the spirit, the evil spirit, many people around the world walk in this evil spirit. But those of you who are born again, those of you who are sanctified and love God, you walk in the goodness. All right. So you walk after this. That's why the apostle Paul says, walk after the spirit and not the flesh, all right? So those of you who are saved, those of you who are Christian, you have the spirit. And what is the spirit? This is the communication uh, with God. God communicates to you through your spirit, all right? And so if you, if you love God, 
then you have you have a good spirit because it is the spirit of God that's speaking to you, which can activate your soul and your body. Sometimes what we do, we cut that off. We cut off the communication with God. So many of you who try to grieve properly, you can't because you cut him off because you might be angry with God. Many of you, I've heard believers say, I'm angry with God. I'm angry with him because he killed my mom. He killed my, my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband. I, uh, okay. And so you begin to get angry with God. So what's happening with the spirit? All right. So to understand this concept is to understand the grieving process and how to deal with it. Okay. Now there's a word here I want to deal with. I don't want to spend too much time with this. Just go on YouTube and we can talk about this here. Uh, because when it comes to your dreams and dreaming about dead people, dead loved ones have gone on. All right. Well, that's, that's dealing with the soul. That's dealing, that's dealing with the soul. And, um, there's a word here. What word I want to use again. So good to see you, Cynthia. Uh, the word I want to use is what, uh, Thana, Thana. Uh, this is, let's see, Thana. What is it? Um, thanatology. I think that's the word. Okay. Thanatology. And then there's another word called uh, Theo. Uh, Theophastic. Okay. These two words pay close attention to them because they are something that uh, psychologists and counselors use and some Christians uh, who use these two concepts to, to try to help you deal with Grief, uh, the study of death and dying, uh, and the means by which humans uh, cope with uh, grief, that's thanatology. All right, that's the method. And there, there's, there's two methods here. One, one method, one is used uh, uh, for uh, forensic purposes, and the other one is used for. Uh, psychological purposes. Okay. Thanatology, the natural and the spiritual. You got to be careful uh, with both of them, depending on who you're dealing with. All right. Thanatology. Uh, and it is something that, well, when you look at some of these, uh, these shows on TV, uh, CSI, what have you, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's thing that thanatology can be used here. Now, as it pertains to Theophastic, I'm an apologetic, okay? Alvin and myself, we talk about that on our show quite a bit when we were, when we were you know, having a show. <laughs> the, the apologetic. Uh, apologetic is not apologizing. It's, reason, it's actually reasoned arguments, okay, in, in justifying um, a, a, a matter or something. Um, ap what, Apollo, what is it? Jetics. Okay, that word there, right? Um, you, you're trying to justify a theory or a, a maybe a religious doctrine or something like that. And that's pretty much, I'm apologetic. I explain the gospel. I explain the word. Jesus is a, an apologetic or he explains. He was rabbi or teacher, okay? Um, so when someone asks me a question about anything social, uh, and I try to tie that to the Bible. I explained the theory. Okay. Well, uh, theophastic is something like that. Okay. The it's called theophastic counseling. Okay. Uh, y'all know when I'm writing on the board, I forget how to spell <laughs> theophastic counseling. Theo, of course, that means God. You see words in the scriptures where you may not see them in the Bible itself, but you see the word uh, theophany. All right. You see, Christ shows up in the Old Testament in certain forms as theophany. And then there's theocracy, theocracy or God rule. All right. Uh, the, the Jews, the Hebrews of the Old Testament was set up under a theocracy because God was the ruling head before they decided that they wanted a king and God gave them King Saul. All right. So theophastic is God. Uh, I believe is light, God of light or God bringing light. God light, all right? It is the light of God when a person is dealing with uh, a trauma, all right? But what is it? It pretty much is a, um, 
an aspect that you use when a person is blaming themselves for tragedy or a mishap or um, I wouldn't have got pregnant if I had not just been out there, if I had not gone to that bar or that club, I would not have gotten pregnant. I would not have got raped if I had just put on a dress that was a little longer and, and I, went, I went down the alley on the way home and I got raped. Okay, so the, that is theophastic, uh, that teaching there. And some counselors uh, delve a little too far and a little too deep, though, in this. And what happens is they use unbiblical uh, psychology, all right, such as repressed uh, memory therapy, and they they don't understand that there's a process that people who grieve need to go through. But many of us in church, we think that we uh, are trying to help somebody, but we're actually harming them, and we use this repressed uh, memory therapy to snatch them out of something. And sometimes we go too deep and we open up our minds to doctrines of devils and mysticism and things like that. And we don't even realize we're doing this. Okay. So these are the two things that you're going to find both the world may be using and we who are uh, of Christ, we use as well because the world uh, are filled with, uh, uh, spiritualists. And these people talk like, they know God, but they don't really know him. Look at the woman who was following Paul and Silas around town and saying, uh, uh, y'all should honor these men. Listen to these men. They're good men of God. All right. And they, he, she did this for a while until Paul finally had to rebuke her and silence her. All right. And so that's what I see sometimes happening uh, that somebody could many people of the world know how to talk to the Christian because all you got to do is use Christian words, Christian terminology, what have you. But it's filled with mysticism. And if you're not tapped in to the spirit of God, I put up the spirit there. If you're not tapped in, if you're not using the gift of discerning of spirits, then you will not be able to recognize it. And so how do you try this spirit that's trying to counsel you? You try it by not the spirit, but you try it by the word of God. Understand the word of God. Know when it's not lining up to what you have been uh, taught through the word of God. Not what your grandmama taught you, your grandfather, or all this stuff, because sometimes some of that was wrong. But you go to the word for yourself. You got to try it for yourself. Uh, the uh, Berean church in Acts studied the word for themselves where? At home. You understand? Y'all with me here. Good. Okay. So these are some of the things that you will see. You just don't know what to call it. And I, I called it out for you. All right. So uh, let's, let's go and talk about the five stages here. See if I can remember it. I'm sure I can find some evidence on, on Google about the five stages. Um, but many of us heard about it. It was from a woman by the name of Elizabeth Kruger Ross. OK, and I think she's either German or she is um, Dutch. OK, and she came up with this. It didn't start with those who were grieving, but it started with those who were dying. There were those who were terminally ill. And she's the one that uh, started um, the, the whole hospice thing. She's responsible for hospice. OK, and that's the end of the road. And she decided to, to counsel or, or t talk to these people and question them on how they were feeling, what type of grief were they going through, knowing that they were getting ready to die. And so she wrote this book called Of Death and Dying, I believe it's called, in 1969. Okay, it's a great book. It was heralded as being one of the great uh, advances in, in, in counseling and psychology and what have you. Uh, through her, and um, and as they began to realize, she she felt that th through this death, uh, this death process, there was three or four, but those who are grieving because a loved one uh, it was dying, she realized that there are five stages. Uh, the first one I think is denial. Okay, uh, the second one, of course, is anger, and the third one is bargaining okay the fourth one is i believe is depression and the last one is acceptance okay 
acceptance, okay? And these are the five stages. Now, everybody don't go through this stage. Understand that. Everybody don't go through all five. Some people will go, may do one and skip down to depression, all right? Some people start at one plot, spot, which is acceptance, and find a way of going back up to anger, all right? And these are the steps. It is, it is a natural thing to do to go through, this, to allow people to go through this process. But again, we spend a lot of time trying to think that we can solve people's problems, and we don't know the pain that people feel when they lose someone and a, a, a two brothers could lose a father, but this brother will say, all right, dad's gone. Let's move on. But this brother feels like I can't move on. I don't know what I'm, I'm going to do. He goes through all steps. It takes him years to get over this grief and they both come out of the same seed. So you cannot determine, you can't determine uh, what these, these people are going to feel. So because you can't determine that, you've got to really tap in to the knowledge of how uh, the mind work, relationships work. But uh, 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 if you can study the word just a little bit more, maybe you would stop saying some of the crazy things I've heard in some of y'all's so-called counseling sessions, all right? If some of y'all say some of the craziest things, all right? Uh, denial, uh, denial is the first of the five stages it helps us to survive the loss. Some of y'all says, what? That helps us? Yes, yes. It helps us to survive, okay? When, you're, when your body shivers because you're cold, that is a survival mechanism that God has implanted in the body. It's called goosebumps. Y'all get the goosebumps? That when you shiver like that, the body warms up. It is a protection. When you sigh okay you just sigh like that that is the body telling you that it needs oxygen we don't breathe like we're supposed to all right so it, it sighs the body is crying out and trying to tell your brain can you tell your body to breathe a little bit more all right so the body was made to 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 e e elasticity and stretch and do strange things that we ignore but it's trying to tell you even when your urine is is too yellow what is what is it telling you when your stool is a certain color what is it telling you when your nose bleed what is it telling you all these are signs warning signs when your ear is is ringing what does that tell you okay these are all signs that god has put in the body to warn you of something okay and so denial can is a healthy warning sign uh, so that you may not uh, do something or think of something that might be even more destructive to you. You understand? So in this stage, the world becomes meaningless and overwhelming. So like uh, life makes no sense. So we are in this state of shock and denial and we go numb and we wonder how we can go on. And if we go on, why we should go on? Why try to find a way to simply get through each day? So denial and shock help us to cope and make survival possible. All right. So when someone goes through denial, don't 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 uh, don't go crazy on them. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Don't don't go don't go crazy on them. number number two is anger. Anger is a necessary stage of the healing process. Be willing to feel your anger. Go ahead, accept it, give in to some of your anger, but do it properly because the scripture is very clear on, uh, about anger. He says, be angry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He says, the next thing is don't sin, but it's okay to be angry. I can five, find all five stages of this grief process in the scriptures. Uh, the more you truly feel it, the more it will begin to dissipate and the more you will heal. So it's okay to be angry. What we told boys coming up is don't be, uh, don't be angry. Uh, don't cry. Don't give in to your feelings. Fight back. Don't let nobody hit you. You hit them back and all these things. So you always been telling a little boy, man up, man up. That's all he's been hearing all his life. Man up, man up, man up. So when tragedy hits his life, he don't know how to cope with it. He don't know what to do with it. And some men go crazy. Uh, they Then they begin to abuse themselves or abuse the woman that they're with, whether it's their wife or fiance or whomever, they, they become abusive. Haven't y'all seen uh, this horrible uh, video where the man is beating this woman at Disneyland. 
Okay, I'm, I'm sure by now you, most of you have seen this video of this black family. They're at Disneyland with the kids, all right? And he, and then there's a fight ensues, and then he's he's fist punching uh, this 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 woman. I don't know if it's his girlfriend or what. I don't know, but it, it, his mom was there. It was it's horrible, right? Or well, something happened in that man's life for him to be that abusive. He didn't. It didn't matter where he was. You understand? When someone is dealing with something, it doesn't matter where they are. They act that thing out. Something happened. And this is what happens in in uh, uh, African American communities, especially because when you go to if you if you hear about shooting mass shootings in schools, especially at, it usually happens in white schools. There's a white person shoots up a school and kills these kids. The the uh, the the city. The government or whomever, wherever they are, the town or the parish, they make sure that they send out counselors. Who are these counselors for? The counselors are for the children, the surviving children. The counselors are for the parents of the children. The, the counselors are for the, the staff uh, of the, the school. Whoever wants it, you can have it for free. But when a, when a black kid gets shot uh, in the town, whatever your town is, there is no counseling given to the survivors of this shooting. It could be one shoot. It could be two people shot because I live in Chicago. So it's common on the weekend to hear about certain shootings in certain neighborhoods. All right. Chicago is a very safe town. But in certain neighborhoods, gangs are killing each other. You understand? But but there's a, a, a innocent bystander who sees this bullet. I've seen it several times. A bullet in the man's head laying there on the ground. All right. And then, well, what do you do? Well, somebody got shot and then you, you move on thinking that your life is normal. And a lot of this stuff uh, is, is embedded in this child's life. And then he gets he grows up. He's in school and, and now he's acting out and the teachers don't know what to do with him. And they, they, they say he's a, 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 he has an attention deficit disorder, all kind of stuff. Right. And they begin to put him in wrong places. And many times these uh, children have PTSD. All right, post-traumatic stress disorder, and and they don't know how to diagnose it. Another one is adverse childhood experience, where these kids are grown now. They might be married and what have you, and they're acting out. Something happened between them and their parents. All right, so this stages of grief uh, is is stomped out from a child who sees these things, and it usually happens again in uh, minority communities. Uh, and now professionals are waking up and they're a little wise uh, to how to treat people who have seen such traumatic, uh, traumatic things. OK. All right. So that's anger. Um, and then bargaining is bef uh, before the loss. It seems like you will do anything if you if only your loved one would be spared. Please, God, please, God, I'll do whatever you need me to do. If you just let my baby live, okay? All right? I will never be angry at my wife again if you just let her live after loss. That's bargaining. A depression uh, at, happens after the bargaining happens, okay? Because you're leaning down, you're leaning further, further into where it, your your mood starts doing this. You, 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 you're, in a, you're on a high here, but then you go down on a low, right? Sometimes low is good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, empty feelings present themselves uh, and grief enters our lives on a deeper level, deeper than we imagine. And this depressive stage feels as though it will last forever. And it's important to understand that this depression is not a sign of mental illness. This is this depression is not clinical depression. All right. It is. This is this is not clinical depression. Don't get it mixed up. The first question to ask yourself is whether or not the situation you're in is actually depression. Mm -hmm. The loss of a loved one is a very depressing situation and depression is a normal and appropriate response to not experience the depression after a loved one dies would be unusual. They're saying it's unusual. So you might have a, a moment of depression, but are you in a state? Of depression. There's a difference between the two. All of you have suffered um, some type of, of moment 
of depression. All of us have, and then we climbed out of it. All right, we climbed out of it. Okay, so but to be clinical depressed, that's another thing, and that's not what she meant here. And then there's acceptance. Acceptance is often confused with the notion of being all right or okay with what has happened, and this is not the case. Uh, most people don't ever feel okay or all right about the loss of a loved one. And this stage is about accepting the reality that our loved one is physically gone and recognizing that this new reality is the permanent reality. It has happened. All right. So don't think because the person is at this stage that they now they're going to they're going to forget about their loved ones. They're going to move on and have a happy live happily ever after. No, they may still be happy, but they're still dealing with grief. It's just that grief don't overtake them. All right. They have accepted he'll never come back home. So let me continue in my life, but have reflections of the good times, right? And this is why sometimes um, we have to be careful how we handle people who are revisited by the memory of a loved one in a dream or in a vision, all right? Be careful how we treat them because you don't know what they're going through. And I get it. You got to be able to be biblical on how to explain a certain act that happened. But if it's not in the Bible, then you need to pray for an answer on how to tell people what's happening in their lives when someone revisit them and they feel like uh, this dead loved one is trying to give us a message, sorry? trying to tell us there's something that's uh, uh, an unfinished business, all right? And they're trying to tell us something so that we can move on with their death, all right? Well, that's their experience that they, that they experience. As long as they don't get too crazy, so too deep on it and begin to continue to go back and try to find that loved one, as long as they don't, they don't start trying to talk to this dead person and, and start using mysticism and, and sorcery and what have you and seance and necromancy, all this stuff can open up a portal uh, for you to turn over to uh, the doctrines of devils, okay? You got to be careful there. But some people had one occurrence of that happened and they moved on. And usually uh, the case of a dead loved one popping up in the memory is it's a it's a subconscious thing. It is natural and normal for someone to continue to dream about a dead loved one depending on how close they were. My, my pastor, first pastor, died in 1995, I think it is. Uh, John Albert Jones, my family will correct me if that's the year, uh, 1995, all right? He was closer to me as, as much as my father was close to me, all right? And to, still to this day, I dream about my uncle. My, he was my uncle. Now, here's the thing. But when I dream about him, he's always doing the same thing. What is that? He's up preaching. He's up preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I wake up, I smile, and I forget all about it after that. I don't think about him that whole day. I'm done. All right. It's the memory. So when these things happen, it is, it is, it is, uh, the, the, the conscious, uh, of the experience that you had and because your heart was close to that person, you are going to dream about them. You cannot put a time limit on people on how they grieve. Stop doing that. Stop telling a person, all right, you, you, all right, too long. You're done grieving now. How are you going to tell a person on how to, how to grieve and how long to grieve, all right? Their grieving process is the way they grieve. But you should be always there for them just in case they do slip off the ladder just a little bit too deep like what I talked about uh, with with uh, Theo, uh, Theo Fostic, um counseling. You got to make sure you know the real word of God, all right? Because if you don't, then you get these counterfeit counselors to come over there and try to lead you off, all right? So be careful. The idle mind still is uh, the devil's workshop, okay? So be careful how you rebuke people or when they're trying to tell you of their experience and let them finish what they're saying uh, because it could cause them to then slip into something else you don't want them to slip into, all right? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that some of you get this. Now, there, there are some things here I do want to bring up that's important for you uh, to see. I did a show on psychology. Matter of fact, my entire book uh, that I wrote here, The Four Women That Men Desire, talks about it's really psychology because what I'm saying in the book is the reason why men are attracted to these four women is for psychological reasons. It's not always sex, 
but it's, it's a, it has a lot to do with the ego, the chest. And the reason why these women act the way they do is for psychological reasons, all right? You, uh, the book is on Amazon.com. Yeah. Read the whole thing. Don't just read one page and say, I'm done. <laughs> okay? I need my uh, godson to talk to someone. He has lost his mother. What? Uh, he, he lost his mom at the age of nine. And he's talking about it to me for the first time. It's been an emotional time for us. See, there it is. Yes, there it is. Uh, Cynthia, uh, I think and dream about my grandmother. Uh, we was real, real close. We were glued together. That's see, there it is. This subject is right on. I had someone I know recently post that they wish that their deceived relative, uh, uh, okay, visit them in their dream. I just responded and told them to ask God to send Jesus instead. That's good, Bennett. That's good. Uh, never give anyone a time frame of when they should be over death. Everyone deals with death differently. Annette says there, that's good. So y'all giving some great advice for those who are going to come in later on and, and see the show on on Facebook. All right. We don't know what we're going through sometimes. My, my mother... Um, uh, call this all together some years ago, 2007 or 2008, 2008, I believe it was or somewhere around there. And she, she told us about cancer had hit her body, uh, breast cancer. And she called the whole family together. And I remember us li- sitting, sitting in the living room and we began to talk about what, what this was. And then that session turned into a moment of grief. All right. How did it turn into a moment of grief? Then my mom and dad were sitting on the couch and her, their children began to talk about how they grieved over other things that was happening that my parents did not know about. All right. There were things that were happening in the church that was hurting us. We had a lot of church hurt coming, coming in, especially we would be uh, most of us. All, most of my brothers are musicians. My sisters were musicians as well. They played clarinet and yeah, something like that. All right. And so we were, we served in the church like, like Levites of a sort. Okay. And so we got a lot of church hurt by, and my parents would take us to church and we wanted to go to church. We enjoyed church, but then we were getting hurt, but we didn't, we were too young to express to them what was hurting us. So as we got older, we began to act it out. How do we act it out? We acted out with our friends. We acted out in our marriages. Okay. We acted it out among ourselves as siblings. We acted it out maybe in the court of law. We just acted out. All right. Because there were some things that hurt us. So uh, while we're sitting there uh, consoling my mother over this cancer, we began to then um, express our hurt and grief over how we were treated as my, my father's uh, sons and daughters by other, other men who were, and women who were the leaders of the church. And my parents didn't know my father says, well, like I, why we didn't know. We didn't know that we, we had no clue that this was happening to you. All right. So it turned into a healing process for the Jones family. And then we all prayed for my mom and then we prayed for healing in our family. And since that time that actually brought my family closer. So we were able to deal with this hurt uh, as an intervention in the sort. Okay. So there are children. Some of you got children who uh, you think that they're fine because they, they're skipping to the, through the tulips. All right. Singing great songs and going to school and they may be getting straight A's. Okay. In class, but there's still something that's missing there. They might be grieving over something that happened and you won't even know it. Unless you maybe sit down and talk with them, take them for a walk. And you'd be surprised what they tell you, what they saw or what they know about what you did or said or what happened to you. And they don't, they can't tell you that they saw you being beat by that man you brought in the house or, or they won't, they can't tell you that they were molested by the man you brought in the house. Sometimes they, they're 50 and 60 years old and then they finally tell it. Okay. Cause they tell me. They call the Sir Walter Jones show and they tell me these things happen. I have, I've hear, heard so many tragic stories from around the country. And my first question to them is, did, did your parents know? Did this? No, no, they don't know. Or I told my mom, but my mom said, you are lying or this didn't happen. Or you should not have put on that skank dress. Okay. Stuff like that. Grief, grief. And we go through this and then we enter into these church houses and then we elevate these people to become apostles 
and evangelists and prophets and pastors and teachers and deacons and the mother's board and the ushers and the minister of music and the musicians, okay? Or we put them in, in the trustees board. We put them all in these positions of hierarchy in the church and they still dealing with grief. And what's happening is I see a layer of layer of grief that's going on among those of the body of Christ. They have not dealt with the last grief when a new grief happens. And then now they got to, they got to cope with this new grief, but never dealing with the old grief. Understand? So the foundation, the foundational grief has never been dealt with. It's, it's like trying to put paint on an old wall, uh, but that old wall got five layers of old paint on it. And you painting this wall trying to make it look brand new. And then you come back a few days later and wonder why that paint it look so dull. You wonder why that paint is cracking. Why you can't keep paint on it? Because it's so many old layers on there. So what you got to do before you paint it, you got to scrape off the old layer. Keep scraping and go down to the bare meat of the wood so that you can put some prime on it. So that that prime could take the new coat. And that's what we have not done. We have not went back to the priming season in our lives and go back. That's why psychologists, they say, what happened to you when you were seven? What happened to you when you were eight, nine and 10? Why? They take you back to the scene of the crime. You're acting out at 55 now, but you're acting out this way because something happened to you 20, 30, 40 years ago that you have never dealt with. You never put this on the surface and say, this happened to me and let me lick at it in the face, a gift horse. Let me lick it in the face and say, all right, I'm done with you. Now let's talk about this, all right, and be done with it, all right? A, a psychologist once told me uh, that all emotions can be listed under three labels. Fear, oh, uh, let me see. Y'all got this right, so I got to write on the board. Three labels. Okay, um, one is fear, okay, fear is one, and then anger, and uh, then sadness, okay, all emotions are found under there, fear, afraid, anxiety, panic, Matthew 6 and 34, um, anger, that's, that's frustration and resentment and r rage, okay, Ephesians 4, 26. Uh, sadness, that's depression, uh, grief, and sorrow, uh, 2 Corinthians 4. I, I, we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, now Jesus was human. Jesus was 100% human, 100% God. He wasn't 50% human, 50% God. No, he was 100. That's a freak of nature. You can't be half pregnant. So Jesus was 100% man who understood, he bared our grief, all right? He understand the, the pain uh, and, and the agony, okay? He understand what, what defeat uh, feels like, all right? Uh, he had compassion for people in need. Uh, remember the leper, uh, the two blind men, uh, the, the people who were, who were hungry and they were starving in the crowd. Jesus actually had anger as well. Uh, he cursed the fig tree. Uh, he whipped the money changers in the temple. All right. He had anger against the Pharisees and I would, I would call it uh, righteous indignation against them. He was angry with them. Okay. He had grief when he rolled on the donkey, when, when Lazarus died. Okay. Um, it, it, it's, it seems, um, weird because he, he knew that Lazarus was going to die and he let Lazarus die because he had a work to do. All right. And after he knew that Lazarus died, when he came, uh, to Lazarus and there was, uh, the, the, the women there, when they told him about the death, what did Jesus do? He cried. He wept. Hmm. Why would Jesus weep knowing? that Lazarus had, he had known he died. He knew he was going to die. Okay. But why did he re weep? Because he was human. How can he feel our adversities and our struggles and pain if he had not gone through those emotional, physiological things that I talked about with the body? 
because he was human as well. He, he, that wasn't the only time he cried when he, I remember a scripture where he was on his way to, he looked at Jerusalem and he began to cry. He had pain and grief for Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen to his people. When he revealed that a disciple will betray him, even in the garden of Gethsemane, he, he had grief. He said, I am grieved even unto death. Matthew 26 and 38, which means he had anguish, okay? In the garden, he, he went through hypertidrosis or something like that, that medical term where you bleed and you, you sweat, that is blood and water, all right? Hematidrosis, I think it's called, I don't know. A joy, he, he, he went through a period of joy when the 70 disciples came back uh, as they went witnessing, okay? He had love. He loved Martha and her sister. Of course, he loved Lazarus and he loved Peter, all right? These things uh, Jesus went through, this grief, but others went through this grief as well. Jonah slipped into depression. The writers of Psalms went into depression. Samson suffered, okay? He had this addiction and the writer of Ecclesiastes uh, Ecclesiastes, he had like this cynical tunnel vision and Elijah, he sunk into uh, grief and depression as he was running from Jezebel. King Saul, he suffered from depression. His was manic depression. Okay. I believe, I believe he was bipolar. Mm -hmm. And so much of this stuff is happening. All right. And so enter the role of psychotherapists who come and try to fix these things for you. And you got to be careful who you select to counsel you because of what, what their standings are. Thank God again for my sister, Arella Milam, who is bringing in uh, 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 Holy Ghost field counselors. One is my cousin, Chantel Biddings, uh, is a licensed uh, a, a Christian counselor. She's coming in next week to talk with us about grief. All right. Uh, drugs and religion in uh, th there is no role for secular psychotherapy. All right. Because they're going to use a lot of well, worldly tactics, and sometimes they use drugs, but there is no role for secular psychotherapy. Mental health does not exist with the unbeliever. That sounds weird, don't it? I don't believe, in fact, Lee, that mental health, all right, mental health does not exist. He can only exchange one problem for another. Y'all go to I, I Zana Van Zant to fix your life. And what she's going to bring? She's going to bring mysticism to you. She's going to talk about demagogues and and um, the uh, the spirit world, okay, and things like that. Transcendental meditation, and things like that. So there is no mental health for those who are unbelievers, okay. So you got to really be careful how you're dealing uh, with, with this because you're going to find yourself again getting caught up and trapped uh, uh, with uh, doctrines of devils, okay. So. What's the answer here? Let me see. Let me see. What 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 would be the answer here? I also want to see about this mm, this this witch of indoor that uh, I know some of the, some of y'all's teaching on the winds of indoor is one way, and I teach it another way. And all of the scholars that I've read out of First Samuel, okay, First Samuel, what is it? Um, twenty eight, I think. Read First Samuel twenty eight. I think it starts at seven, but read. This is the witch. Okay, the witch of Endor. I need you to be careful on the proper interpretation of the witch of Endor because I know what y'all are saying. But this is the one time that God moved in a very peculiar way. He's, he's, he did it one time and he didn't do it again because he was trying to teach Saul a lesson. And he allowed the witch to summons up Samuel. I know y'all saying that wasn't Samuel, that was a demon. No, that was Samuel. Oh man, I'm in trouble for this one. Mm -hmm. Stay strong, brother. I pray God gives you strength. Thank you, Deloney. I love you, brother. Acceptance should never be confused with healing. Uh huh. Uh, it's really just the first step in the healing process. Uh, as an ordained minister of the gospel, I was given a time frame to grieve the death of my husband. 
at that particular time, only one week had passed. I was told to get up and get on with the work of the Lord. That changed my direction in teaching others about grief. The Lord began a great ministry in me in the area of great counseling, a grief counseling that is. Unfortunately, it was not at that church. <laughs> she said it was not at that church. Yes, uh, some mom, that was Amber Rogers, by the way. Uh, Art says some mom has been through uh, same like experience, molestations, and feel they survived so her child should be able to also, why whine about it, but mom has not truly dealt with it just buried it. Art Lewis, that's good, man. That's some good stuff. Okay. This witch here, God gave the witch the ability, like he gave the donkey the ability to speak to the prophet. All right. The scriptures call it a dumb ass. Okay. In first or second Peter. All right. So God then gave uh, the witch the ability to summons up Samuel to teach Saul a lesson. Did they recognize, did he recognize Samuel? Yes, he did right away. Number two, if a, uh, when, if that is a demon, demons don't, uh, come up and try and help you seek God. All right. Uh, demons will tell you truth because Satan uh, did tell Adam and Eve part truth in the garden and Satan will give, I talked about the decon and rat poison. I use that analogy a lot, how I talk about how decon and rat poison has got 95% good food and it has 5% poison. Okay. All right. And that's, that's how Satan operates. Satan is decon rat poison. He's good at it. But right here, God used the witch. All right, look at the scriptures. Be very careful how you read King James because it can trip you up if you don't really understand it. There was an evil spirit that entered. It said the evil spirit from God entered into Saul. Well, the Bible never says uh, that there was no evil in God. So God does not tempt a person. Okay, so if that's the case, then how did this evil spirit from God enter into Saul. When has he ever done it before? Because you don't understand proper uh, hermeneutics and exegete. All right. Because what God did was he used Satan. So it's like God did it, but he used Satan. I'll talk about Job in a minute. He used Satan. All right. To do a work. So that's why the, the King James says an evil spirit from God, but it actually came from Satan. You understand what I'm saying? So here God used that allow the witch to summons up Samuel. And what did Samuel tell Saul? Samuel told Saul what's getting ready to happen to him. And Samuel went back to the grave. If that was a demon, then the demon would have deceived Saul. The demon don't come up and tell you to seek the Lord and find solace in God and, and seek salvation. Demons don't tell you. Uh, to do that. All right. And if, if they do with the 90%, they're going to come back with 5% poison, but that didn't happen with Samuel, did it? No, it did not. All right. So you got to understand the proper interpretation here. I had to explain it this way because if I don't, uh, my job as a teacher is to bring correction as well. All right. And I don't care of the darts that get thrown my way, because if you're bold enough to teach it wrong, I'm bold enough to correct you. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm bold enough to do that. All right. So in, in this whole situation, the, the book of Job is a perfect example of the situation of grief. But the book of Job is the perfect example of how not to grieve or not how, how not to help people grieve. OK, it's, it's a perfect example. Why? Um, because if you notice. When Job was, there was four people that really made this story very enlightening and it should have taught you a lesson. All right. Uh, Job had three friends. Okay. Now un look at the conversation. S it was Satan is in this picture. And then there's God in this picture. There are the angels in this picture. Okay. And the angels are considered the children of God. All right. And the children of God was meeting with the children of God was meeting with God in the heavens. 
They was having a board meeting and Satan showed up and Satan showed up in the meeting. All right. Now he, he was cast down. He was cast down, but he still have the ability to uh, be with God in the heaven. Now, what part of heaven? Because there's, we, we believe there's three heavens. Okay. Because the apostle Paul was caught up in the third heaven. All right. Okay. So that's another story. So then Satan uh, answered God's question. Where was he? He says, I'm on, I'm on the ground down there just seeking who I might devour. God says, have you considered my servant Job? No, I can't. I can't fool with him. Why? Because you got a hedge around him. And then God says, okay, I'm going to remove that hedge and you do whatever you will with him. Just don't touch his life. All right. That's the conversation that's happening here. So is God using Satan? Yes. Is that the only time he used Satan? No, he used him a, a whole bunch of more times in the scriptures. A whole bunch of more times. So again, an evil spirit from God or really from Satan because God is using him. Is that making any sense to any of y'all out here who question the validity of my teaching? Okay. All right. So with this, uh, his three, his three friends came on the scene. What's his three friends name? Well, I call his three friends, Mo, uh, Larry and Curly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those were Job's three friends. Y'all got another name for them in the scriptures, but that's their names. Mo, Larry and Curly. And they were three stooges. Okay. All right. And they began to try and tell Job that the reason why he's suffering was because of him. All right. It's because of him. Theophastic counseling. Uh-huh. It was because of him. And then his Job's wife came on the scene and says, you need to curse God and die. Lord have mercy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Come on now. All right. So this right here is something that we can learn from uh, the Job story because when they got through trying to counsel Job and after the wife said curse him and all these things, then God finally speaks. He speaks in Job chapter 38 and he <laughs> it's funny to me. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dude, come on, man. You, you ain't even thinking. What, who, you, he said, darkens counsel. He said, gird up now. He said, man up. For I will demand of thee the answer that you're looking for. He says, where were you when I put the foundation? I, I laid the foundation of the earth. Declared, okay? So what is God doing? God is correcting him for listening to Mo, Larry, Curly, and the Jesse that he made. Okay, all these people. He said, man, what happened to you? Why is it that you listen to all these people when you should be focusing on me? Because you, you I told Satan, you ain't going to turn on me. You are, you are shoe evil. You are a holy man. You an upright man. Now you, 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 you trying to make me look bad. You didn't turn over to these doctrines of, of devils here. Okay. And this is the kind of counseling sometimes we have to give for those who are believers and they turn over to these, these, these palm readers and soothsayers and all these other things. You got to reel them in. And sometimes you got to use some tough love. Whoa, come back on the fold. How dare you? Remember when you, God saved you? Remember when he delivered you? How could you possibly go back out there into the world for so, uh, uh, counseling and, and things like that? All right. So let's bring up some scriptures since we're there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Bildad, uh, Eliphaph, and Zophar are their names. Uh, Molaire and Curly. That's what I said, Amber. Y'all ain't listening. Okay. All right. Let's close this down. Hey, y'all, how long I've been on here? I got to close it down. I didn't want to go long because, you know, when you get to talking about this stuff, it's so much, only so much you can do. Um, Matthew, uh, Matthew five and four, blessed are or happy are the the pure in heart, for they shall she got see God. But also, blessed are they that mourn. Okay, 
I'm giving you some scriptures that justify your ability to grieve. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to mourn. Those who put on sackcloth and ashes, all right? They did that, not so much because they were sad um, and mourning, but sackcloth and ashes was a sign of repentance. Understand, sackcloth and ashes was a sign of repentance and, and, and turning, okay? Uh, the great Ecclesiastes chapter, th chapter 3, okay? Uh, gives uh, a wonderful song that says, To everything turn, 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 there is a season, turn, turn. Back in the 1970s, I write that rock group. And I'm like, why are they singing gospel songs on the radio by a white group? Okay, uh, there is a season, and that sometimes that season is to mourn. There's a, there's a season to cry, all right? There's a season uh, to be angry, but then it says, but then it gives this wonderful a contrast of, yes, there's a season to weep, but there's a season to get up and rejoice, all right? So you are probably going through that season right now. Let them go through that season. One hour. Okay, thank you, Bennett. There is a season. Uh, Romans uh, chapter, what, 12 and 15 says, weep with those that do weep. Jesus wept with the, the, the women and the people in that town over Lazarus. He wept with them because he understood. I'm human and I have frailty too. I have the emotion in me that is to, to weep. Okay. And so you weep with them. We are grieving. Y'all grieve with us until the grieving time is over. Ephesians, uh, what is it? Ephesians 4 and 26. Be angry. Be angry. It's okay. But please, y'all, uh, just don't sin while you're being angry. Okay, uh, second, uh, second chronic, uh, Corinthians, second Corinthians two and five through eight. Uh, this right here, let me see if I can pull this up. I may have to read this one. Uh, bear with me, y'all. I'm almost done. Second Corinthians, uh, what is it now? Second Corinthians five, second Corinthians two, sorry, second Corinthians two and five. Uh, five, it says, I am not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. All right. This is the forgiveness for the sinner. All right. He hurt y'all more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and what? Comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. When I messed up in church, the church didn't do that to me. They, they, they were hurt by what I did. I sinned and they were hurt. And so they took it out on me really harsh. All right. And it and 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 notice Paul says, man, he he heard y'all more than he heard me. He says, but but he says, but you did you you did too much. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. They overpunished me, and that's what's happening. Some of you have experienced that in your church, or your church hurt. They overdid it. But notice what he says here. However, it is time to forgive, not just forgive him, and then walk away. Talk to him, comfort him, have some some sessions with him. Take him out to to eat at his favorite restaurant. Comfort him, pray with him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. Mm. He said, "Do it now." Okay, do it now. Some of some of you don't know how to grieve, and you take it out. You take it out on the people of God, and it's inappropriate to do that. Um, first Chronicles 10 and second Samuel 11 talks about the fasting process. And some of you, uh, uh, what I call grief fasting. Okay. Grief fasting. All right. That's in the scriptures. First Chronicles 10 and 11 and second Samuel 1 and 11. That's grief fasting. Um, John. John 
9 and 1. Okay, through 3 talks about it's not your fault. John 9, 1, let's see, John chapter 9 and 1, as Jesus was walking alone, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sin? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sin, Jesus said. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry on out the task assigned us by the one who sent us, all right? So some people are sick and you grieve and you don't understand. Some people actually do die and you grieve and you don't understand and you go through the questioning of God, you go through anger and bargaining. But Jesus said that that doesn't mean that this person did something, all right? And that, that whole uh, uh, bad counseling that y'all do for people who feel like they did something, okay, all these things. Well, who, does it have to be somebody's fault? Does it have to be? But sometimes people remove, I mean, God can remove a person from the earth so that he can operate or do a great work in you, all right? Some of you who are a part of a church where you lost your pastor, you might have been leaning too much on that pastor for everything. And we wear pastors out. We wear them out mind, body, and soul. We wear them out physically, all right? And so God, sometimes I believe he removed those pastors so that you could um, now start eating milk. I'm sorry, <laughs> eating uh, meat <laughs> because y'all been drinking milk under the pastor and he, you're cutting teeth, but you're still sucking on breasts. And God wants you to... Uh, eat meat. That's why he put teeth in your mouth, not that you continue to drink milk. He put teeth in your mouth to be able to eat some table food. All right. Some of you are vegetarians, so you don't really have to eat meat. All right. But you're at least eating table food. All things work together for the good. Okay. But to who? To them what? Y'all can finish that. Okay. To who? In Romans 8 28. Um, First Thessalonians. I'm almost there, y'all. Almost there. First Thessalonians 4 and 13 says this. Um, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Hope. We have hope. Okay. And we, we mourn because it is, it is a natural thing to do because of our human frailty, our connection to that person. All right. So go ahead and mourn. But... In your mourning process, continue to have hope that you will see that person again. So I celebrate for all of the pastors that are lost because I believe that I will see them again, but I'll see them in a different way. These people who are in heaven are not uh, seeing you as some of you misinterpret the, the cloud of witnesses that the scriptures talk about. That's not who that is. These are not dead people who are uh, looking down at what's going on. Because if they are in heaven and there is no weeping and there is no grief in heaven, all right, uh, then uh, there's grief and, and weeping here and destruction down here. God will not allow them to be up there and see destruction, uh, all right, and sadness. No, they are asleep, the Apostle Paul says. So he says, we shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die, all right? I show you a mystery, okay? So they are asleep and they are present with the Lord, understand? And they cannot come back from the dead and, and speak to you. Luke chapter 16, talk about rich man and Lazarus. And this rich man wanted uh, to send this messenger back up to talk to his loved ones. And the messenger says, can't do that. They got Moses and the prophets. If they ain't going to believe Moses and the prophets, they ain't going to believe me. All right. So you got to understand this. 
um, Matthew, um, what did I read that? Yes, Matthew 10 and 29, he talks about the sparrow. God's got his eye on every bird that fall from the sky. Why would you not think that he has not focused his attention on you? Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 talks about a good thing here. Okay, if I can get this to work here. Because I want to talk about what sort of condolence should a Christian give someone who was hurting after the death of a loved one. Uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, where I want to go. Um, I'm, I'm almost there, y'all. I know I keep saying that, but I must have Kojic in me. Mm-hmm. Ecclesiastes 7 and 2 says this. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. Oh, man, now that's weird. That's weird, y'all. This is weird. Here's what it say. A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die is better than the day you are born. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everybody dies, you saying. So the living should take this to heart. <laughs> Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. Did you understand that last part? That's what he mean by that. It's the it's the uh, the, the the first process in the in the uh, in the five steps is denial. So remember, I said I can find all five five stages in the scriptures. Well, this is denial. The denial process is it is a protection mechanism. It is a it is a it is a way to escape to a place so that you won't hurt yourself or be hurt. So he says it's better to just go to funerals. <laughs> go to funeral. Don't go to the party. He says, because sorrow is better than laughter. He says, um, for sadness has a ref- has a refining influence on us. It's Ecclesiastes. Uh, chapter 7 and 2. Yes, because when you're born, you're coming into a trouble world. Come on, come on, sir. Come on, Justin. All right. Psalms 56 uh, and 8. God says, oh, I know. I hear your tears. Okay. I hear your tears. I see them. And I have placed your tears in a bottle. Mm-hmm. Save it for a rainy day. So all of the tears that you've cried for your loved one, even when they was going through the sickness of cancer and they've even gone through hospice care. All right. And, and all the crying you do, you think that your tears are wasted. They're not. God says, I see it. And he placed them in the bottle. And, they, and one day he's going to open up that bottle and just pour it out and take a bath in it and answer uh, your, your weeping and mourning and, and prayers and what have you. He sees it all. OK, uh, and so the word that you need to pay close attention to is this word right here. Paraclete. OK, or paracletos is in the Greek. That's out of John uh, 14 and 16 through 17. OK, that is a comforter. OK, it's a comforter. Or a counselor. Mm-hmm. All right, this is important here. Paraclete. I'll talk about that in one second. But the question is asked: What sort of condolence should a Christian give someone who was hurting after the death of a loved one? Uh, for those who don't have such uh, hope in eternal life, a Christian can still be a trusted friend and a listener. It can be helpful to share with the grieving person about the various stages he or she may go through in the grief process. Although everyone grieves differently, the following are some common stages we go through in common, uh, I'm sorry, in coming to terms with the death of a significant person in our lives. Are you ready for this? All right, here it is. Number one, initial shock. Initial shock. Okay. All right. Somebody put my time up there, please. Somebody put my time up there. Shock. Okay. Shock. 
uh, it, uh, this may include expressions of denial and anger as uh, the mind cannot accept all at once what has happened. The second one is numbness. Numbness. Okay, one is shock, two is numbness. I saw the text that Bishop Moody had died. I went into shock and then I got numb. Uh, three, struggle between fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, fantasy and reality. Okay, there's a struggle. And this stage involves thinking we hear the departed one's voice, seeing a glimpse of her in a passing car, or reaching for the phone to call her or him. All right? Fantasy and reality. And a lot of this, again, is happening by uh, your subconscious, your connection with this loved one. All right? That's why you notice that if two people were married for 50, 60, 70 years, the husband dies and then the wife dies shortly after or vice versa. I understand? Because they were one. Uh, as a, in the union, number five, stabbing memories, okay, uh, stab memories, mm -hmm. okay, stabbing memories, okay, daddy says she got, what, okay, <laughs> what are you saying here, stabbing memories, just when we think we are getting past it, someone who doesn't know the situation will ask how to depart one how the departed one is doing. Yeah. An anniversary or, or another milestone passes without the loved one. The memories are painful but necessary. Talking about the memories with tears is healthy and a part of moving on. And uh, let's see. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. I don't know how I messed that up. The first one is initial shock. Numbness is number two. Three is a... Oh. Oh, the struggle. Yeah. Okay. Oh, four is actually, let's put, let's put flood of grief. Okay. Flood of grief, often triggered by something trivial. Months or years after the death, grief can flood in again, bringing the loss back in, in all its power. We dissolve in copious tears and mourning just when we thought we were past the initial pain. Remember I talked about the five stages of grief, how you can go through all five and be fine for weeks, months, maybe years, and then go back to the recycling process. That is the flood of grief. And uh, this last one, number six, is recovery. Okay, recovery. Uh, a new a new normal emerges as we begin to believe that life will go on and there will come a day when we won't hurt like we do right now. Okay, last one, Paraclete, John 14 and 16. And here's what it says as we finally shut this down. John 14 uh, says this, John 14 and 16. Uh, if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. That's what this is. Who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Okay? The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. He was talking to the disciples when he said later. And then it happened, Acts chapter 2, when they were all in one cord, one place, and suddenly a sound as a rushing mighty wind, it filled the house where they were sitting, okay? And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in tongues. That it was like cloven tongues like as a fire. Uh -huh. So the Holy Spirit came as a... Paraclete. So when you are grieving and you're grieving alone, those of you who have taken on that, that first part of my, my board where I talked about body, soul, and spirit, 
those of you who have taken on the spirit of Christ, okay, then through your, through your grieving process, once you, once you make sure you don't close the door to the Holy Spirit, then that part of communication with God, that spirit part that I put on the board, he is now your paraclete. He, in the absence of your human counselors and comforters, he is now your comforter and your counselors, all right? The world don't understand it. They're not looking for it. We have, we have not equipped the world with this knowledge because we're now, we're, we're building our churches like country clubs. It's us and nobody else, all right? We've become selfish. And like the disciples and the apostles of old, they were kind of bigots in a sense. That's why they couldn't go out and minister and witness to nobody else. They were, they were, they were like, they were kind of xenophobe, all right? Why do you think God had to put this sheet of meat in front of Peter and say, hey, 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 rise up, man, eat this. And it was unclean meat. And he said, I can't eat this. This is unclean. God says, how dare you call what I made unclean? Eat this stuff. Why? Because he was preparing this xenophobe to witness to who? These Gentiles who they like, they thought that the kingdom was coming. That these, these the apostles, the kingdom was coming only to them. The disciples were like, uh-uh, no, no, you, you talking to that woman at the well? Uh, that, that's, uh, you're not supposed to, we, we don't have any dealings to do with, with, with them. Okay. And so these, these Samaritans, all right. Uh, it goes all the way back to the old Testament with, with Jonah. All right. He, he didn't want to go to Nineveh because uh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't like him. All right. He figured he'd go down there to, to Tarshish or, or uh, Joppa or wherever he went. All right. There's a lot of xenophobia in the, in the word. And God was trying to teach the, the Jews. You will want strangers. You were in bondage for 400 years. How dare you not look after those who uh, are in need? Okay? So now that the Holy Spirit rests in us, He now is our counselor, our comforter, our parakletos. And I think someone put, the, uh, put it on here. Um, uh, where is that? Bennett, blessings to you. So always good to see you. Um, who, who is that? Amber put parakletos from the Greek word paraclete. It means advocate or helper use of one call to help in a court of law. You understand the court of law. And that's why I did a teaching on binding, um, um, uh, pleading the blood. Remember that show that I got in trouble for, for pleading the blood. You plead the blood, and, and I told y'all that that was a myth. Anyway, I'm not going to do that no more. <laughs> the blood was applied. You don't have to plead the blood anymore. It was already applied. So the Holy Ghost, you ain't got to be tearing on the altar and spitting and slobbing uh, for the Holy Ghost to come. The Holy Ghost came in Acts chapter 2. It never left, all right? In the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost came, and then it left them. That's why David says, don't take your spirit from me. It came on Sam, uh, um, um, who, who was that? Samson, and then it's gone again, okay? Uh, because it rested and then it left. So then Jesus says, now this comfort going to come and he's going to show you all truth. He ain't going to never leave you nor forsake you. He's part of the Godhead, all right? So you ain't got to go G, 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 on the altar no more, all right? Because he is here. He never left. He is your comforter and counsel. You call on him. And here he is, all right? He rests in you. And last but not least is Ephesians. Ah, uh, Ephesians. Y'all know my handwriting is atrocious. I can't even spell atrocious, but you know that's atrocious. But I think you're getting it. Ephesians 4 and 30 is payback. Mm-hmm. Y'all going to be shocked if, you are, if you don't already know what this is going to say. Y'all going to be shocked because this is payback. Because why y'all busy grieving, guess who else is grieving? says here, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. He say, y'all grieving? I'm going to be a paraclete to you. But do me a favor, don't grieve me. Grieving, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. All right? Y'all understand that? And that's where I close. Be fair. If you're going to grieve, grieve with hope in your heart. Mm-hmm.
Yes, the big payback. Come on, come on, come on, Cynthia Sarton. The big payback. If I'm going to be a paraclete to you, if I'm going to counsel you through this process, don't grieve me. Don't block me out of the, of the process of healing you. Sure, go through man's five stages. Man didn't create that. I created it. I just gave man the ability to put it in an order. Okay, but you ain't got to follow that order. Some people lost a loved one and went right into acceptance and lived a, a healthy life, understanding that I'm, I'll see that person again. That may not be your testimony. So does God gave a lot of scriptures and a lot of men who are Holy Ghost filled, who wrote these texts to help you through the grieving process. Yeah, it's all in the word. It says, but grieve, but don't grieve me. Remember, I created you. I've given you life. And I gave you, I allowed you to have the ability to have that wife, that husband, that child, that uncle, that auntie. I, I gave you the ability. I gave you that relationship and that fellowship with them. And now they're gone. All right. So don't grieve me. I'm here for you. So we got to be careful, y'all, how we counsel people. You can't tell people to move on. You've grieved enough. That is not a God. Don't. Don't do that. You focus their attention back on God and the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, so that in the absence of man, all right, when we're not around, when we're not at church with those who are grieving, they're at home Monday through Saturday, who can they lean on? And then you show them the scriptures. Have sessions like we're doing at our church at Faith Temple, all right? And uh, let, let the people talk about the spirit as well as the natural. Bring in counselors. Bring them in, those who are, who are Holy Ghost filled, those men and women out there. And, and I want uh, y'all need to know that psychology is huge. Do you not know the average person that I talk to right now um, who's, going to, who's in school, whether they're online or whether they physically go to campuses, they're studying psychology? Yes. It seems like 80% of the people that are my age or maybe a little younger than me who are now in school, guess what they're studying? Psychology. That's weird, ain't it? Why do you think these Christians who are going back to school deciding that they're going to, they want to study psychology instead of these other little things? You know why? Mm. I think for the same reason why uh, many of my associates on social media are atheists. They, were, they said they were once Christians. And now 100% of all atheists that I know were once Christians and now they hate God. They say they don't believe in God, but they really, they hate God. Romans chapter one. All right. Why? They didn't get the proper answers. They was mistreated. They, they went through hurt and pains. Okay. And all kinds of stuff in church, the church. And, and, and then they gave in to their own lust. You understand? All right. So now the people are getting older and wiser and opening up the scriptures and they, they're studying psychology because they understand about the soul part. Remember the soul part here? Body, soul and spirit. They are studying the soul. They realize that is the seat of the psychology. That's the seat of man. And I maybe I'll be able to understand why Mother Mother Bobo was so angry and upset. Why that usher is just just mean and honor it. All right, when I just want a seat. I mean, gosh, okay, all right. Why are they angry? And, and because many of the people in the church have not dealt with, have not been, been able to cope with a loss. They're grieving, PTSD, uh, trauma, all kind of stuff they're dealing with, okay? And so, y'all are going back to school. If, if somebody paid for my education, I'd go back too. I want, a, I want, a, I want a degree in psychology. I sure do. If y'all sent me some money, and pay for my college education, I would go back and do four years. I'd do it tomorrow. I know it takes a little time. Yes, I would. I would. I'd do it. So y'all can go to Cash Map Me. <laughs> Sir Walter J. Uh huh. That's my Cash App right there. Uh huh. Sir Walter J. You want to send me to school? I'll go. Mm hmm. And I won't let you down. I'll, I'll be valedictorian. Is that, is that, can you be that in, in college? I don't know, but I bet you I, I'd get all A's. Sir Walter J. Mm -hmm. Cash at me that, and I'll, I'll go to school tomorrow. Yeah, all right? I believe the Lord can equip me even better to understand what these things are, because right now it's below my pay grade, but the Holy Spirit has given me the wisdom to be able to teach the things that I feel can help you. 
Y'all pray for me. I have to preach this Sunday morning at my church, Faith Temple, and um, hopefully I can continue a type of uh, teaching on on healing uh, this Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Meet me in Evanston and I will be giving the word. All right. Got to go, y'all. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for all you've done for us in this time, in this season, in this hour, even in this political climate and this spiritual climate that we're in. Thank you for those who've been here, done the work. They fought a good fight and they finished the faith and now they're gone and they're with you, laying in your bosom. God, I thank you for these men and women who did a great work and left a memory for us. And so now when we we go to bed at night and, and dream about them, God, we dream about the greatness of their work so that we can be reminded of their teachings and their teachings f- caused us to focus not on them, but their teachings focus us to focus on you. And so when, we, when I think about my pastors that have gone on, I, I smile even in my sleep and slumber, and I think about the goodness and the grace of God on how you left these teachers, these preachers here, long enough for me to get the word in me and and give me an an opportunity to search it for myself at home. Thank you for these men and women of God. Thank you, God, and you raising up a new seed, all right, a new generation of those who are going to continue in the work. I thank you for these new ones. With the hope, God, I pray that they will also reach back and strengthen others and train and instruct them as Elisha sat up under Elijah. God, do this, God, as Timothy and Titus sat up under uh, the Apostle Paul, all right? As Aquila and Priscilla began to teach and train Apollos that they might show him a more perfect way, God. And so as I sat up under these great teachers, God, help me so that I might teach those who are coming up like myself. Thank you, God, for your strength. And so I pray for those who are going through the grieving process. God, I ask that you continue to comfort them and pick up their bowed down head. And, land, and I hope them, help them to focus on the paraclete that you left here for us. The counselor, ah, the comforter is here. I love you. And we'll continue to give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Thank God, y'all. Thank God and amen. The Bennets love you and are grateful to God. We found you. We also purchased. Oh, wow. Wow. Y'all see her name is Beloved Bennett. Oh, Lord have mercy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm honored. I'm honored. Uh, y'all go ahead and you can pick up the book and you will hear my story in the book. You'll hear your story in the book. And uh, there's the cash app. So Walter J, if you want to give to the ministry, you can. But you all know I don't cry over that. All right, uh, and hit the share button, please. Share it with someone who's grieving, going through the process right now. Hit that share button. It's just, it's just about a little less than 20 of you left on Facebook. Though. But those of you on YouTube, go ahead and share this with the, with the people and um, subscribe. All right? We love you. Pray for me. I'm hungry, and I better put some food in my belly. I know it's late, but I like to work late. That's my schedule. So while you up working tomorrow at eight and nine o'clock, don't 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 think about me because you're gonna hear some snoring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm gonna be up all night working, but I'm gonna be in the bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the way I operate. Hey, uh, Alexa, uh, say good night to the people. Good night. Sleep tight. Bye bye. I love y'all. <laughs>